Good morning, everyone. Pardon my voice, I'm recovering from an illness, and so if it doesn't come off as smoothly and charmingly as normal, then you'll forgive me, I hope. So friends, this has been a very special year, as already has been acknowledged so many times from this podium. We had uh, bicentenary celebrations throughout the United States, and as many of you know, the National Spiritual Assembly was quite interested in knowing exactly what took place during the course of the celebrations. Uh, what were the relationships and the things that the friends did leading up to the weekend of the Twin Holy Days, and then of course, to the extent that we could, learning also what would come next once these relationships had been formed. And to this end, one of the things that we did was to send out a survey to local spiritual assemblies, also a survey to individual believers. And some of you, if you have emails on file with us, you may have received that survey. You may also have responded to it. And because we just wanted to get a sense of, well, what did the Baha'is do and what was the result of that? And in a letter that the National Assembly sent uh, in, right in time for the feast, uh, the last feast, you saw you know, the joy of the National Spiritual Assembly in being able to report to the friends that in uh, celebrations large and small, in every corner of the country, we had a total of some 120,000 participants about two-thirds of them not members of the Baha'i faith. And this is really a remarkable victory for, for the country. Yes. And this was very exciting news, but just as exciting were the stories that we received from people who told us about the initiatives that they had undertaken. In the individual survey, what we asked the friends to do was to tell us you know, sort of in an open-ended question, what did you do and what did you experience? And friends, just the story of the joy and the sense of confirmation, the sense of blessing that people had in sharing with their friends the, the birth of Baha'u'llah, but also the life of Baha'u'llah and what his life meant to humanity and the future of the world just came shining through in these stories. I remember one morning, I was, the, the survey results were in and I had not yet seen everything, and my assistant at the National Center said, well, can we have these individual narratives that people have sent in? How do you want to handle that? When do you want to read them? And I said, oh, well, just print them out for me, and I'll read them during lunch. Because during lunch, I go home, and you know, over lunch, I can just read through them. And, and I, I never imagined, and she said, well, you sure you want me to print them out for you like that? And I said, well, sure, because I never imagined. So I came back from the meeting right before lunch, 600 pages of stories from individual believers about their teaching work. But I read them all. Now, not at lunch. I don't have a lunch break that's that long, but I did read them. And friends, I was just overwhelmed, I have to tell you, with the spirit of, of faith, of fidelity, of happiness that came shining through on every page in what the friends had done to remember their Lord and to remember Him with others. There was a particular story that I found quite moving. And I'd like to share this narrative with you to begin this presentation, because I think it makes two important points. The first, of course, is the point of the wonderful spirit of the friends, but there's another point that you also see in here, and I'll address that as soon as I read it. Now, I also want to mention that this comes from Paducah, Kentucky. This is not the first place on earth you'd necessarily expect to see an outstanding victory in teaching. It's part of the Bible Belt, it's a very conservative area, yet even in circumstances like that, when the friends made an effort, you'll see what the result of it was. Paducah, writes the, the person who sent in the report, is part of a region in the U.S. where the faith has not experienced very much growth. In fact, in the whole state of Kentucky, there are only two local spiritual assemblies. Our moving to Paducah, this is people who had just moved there, will hopefully mean that a third can soon be formed. So this small band of Baha'is set out to organize a modest celebration at their local library. In the months leading up to the celebration, they had quite a few meaningful conversations with friends in their community. Among these friends was a group of local pastors who alongside some of the Baha'is have formed a race unity group in the community. 
On the basis of these initial conversations and the friendships formed, one of the believers invited them to a meeting the day after the bicentenary celebration to consult about how the junior youth program might be offered in the city. He was planning to seek their help identifying youth and junior youth from their congregations who could participate. Now these pastors, I'll make it a little bit short, but these pastors came to the celebration and then the next day they were gonna talk about the junior youth program. So they came to the observance. They met and they were all still reeling from the film. The film, of course, is Light to the World, the film about Baha'u'llah. Their response was overwhelmingly positive and supportive. These are these pastors, Christian pastors. They commented on how beautiful and diverse the film was. One of them said that it was clear that the film captured something that was missing in their congregations. Another said that he had been struggling to help his congregation connect to teachings that were thousands of years old and that the teachings of Baha'u'llah were so fresh and relevant. They all agreed to help in whatever way they could to get the junior youth program going in the community. One of the pastors indicated that although in the churches they talked a great deal about principles such as justice, they didn't know how to bring about meaningful change at the level of the community and suggested that working with the Baha'is to offer the junior youth program was a way that they could do that. Some of them said that their only concern was the objections that might be raised by certain members of their congregations. In response to this, one of the pastors said, well, they all just need to see the film, then they will understand. Isn't that amazing? So of course, there's the initiative <clears throat> and the boldness and the confidence of the friends in presenting the life and the mission of Baha'u'llah to these dear souls who sincerely are looking for a way forward. And we have to assume, friends, that there are millions and millions of people who desire justice, who want to see racial understanding established in our country, who want to see the right thing done, who want a bright future for all of the young people. But they don't know a way forward. And this speaks to the second point, the, the fact of their attendance and the warmth of their receptivity to the message, just like the other tens of thousands of people who attended our celebrations all over the United States testify to a deep spiritual thirst that now is growing on the part of Americans in response, I think, to the fragmentation, to the deceptions, to the lack of trust increasingly that people have in the media, in their government, in their other social institutions, and so on, and all sense that things are deeply wrong and seemingly, rather than progressing, are probably even getting worse. And they want a way forward. Now, many people in response to this have begun to stand up when they see injustice and to protest the things that are going on around that, that they see as wrong. And this is legitimate and a valid thing. And even Baha'is can be a part of those kinds of demonstrations and protests as long as we don't do it in a partisan manner. That is to say, well, don't elect this guy or elect this guy, that sort of a thing. But we, we can stand up. But one of the problems that really has faced our country and that has faced the philosophers and the thinkers and the sages of all, all the ages past, all down through the years of human history, is not just how we stand up when we see injustice, but how do we create justice? What sort of a system do we need to build that actually establishes peace and justice and full participation, that allows for every human soul to fulfill his or her potential in the life, to partake fully in the benefits of civilization, but also to make a full contribution to that civilization? Well, it's more than, than just standing up when we see something wrong. It's how do we create something right? Even Mahatma Gandhi, the great thinker, who is so well known for uh, his, uh, his principle of civil disobedience, which to some extent, as we know, inspired Martin Luther King in many of his activities, is less known for something that he spent just as much time writing about and talking about, which he called a constructive program. He said humanity has to have a plan. You've got to have a plan, a constructive program, a way in which to have a just society. Now the elements of such a program would include such factors as 
an interpretation of human history. In other words, an acknowledgement of where we have come in human history to this point. How we got here, what went right, what went wrong, and an acknowledgement of that. But also a sense of where human history can now go. What is the assumption that we have about human nature? Are we animals? in the true sense of that word, that is, without a spiritual dimension, who are unalterably selfish and aggressive and irredeemably, you know, out for ourselves? Or is there another capacity in human beings that also can be cultivated, that transcends those lesser instincts which, we've, of course, we acknowledge are there? There are assumptions about the role of power and how power is exercised in a society. Assumptions about the role of institutions of society, the role of religion, assumptions about race and gender and class, about economics, how we participate in the ordering and the governing of ourselves as a society. All of these elements have to be there, and they have to be coherently expressed, coherently pursued, coherently understood and learned from, so that a true civilization can be built that establishes justice in the world. Finally, the plan has to work. It's one thing to have a theory, it's another to have a plan that actually sees results, that actually works and where you can see progress being made. Now the Baha'is have a plan. We have a vision that's coherent, that's meaningful, that addresses all of these questions and more. And it is our task, friends, to translate that plan, that vision, that's enshrined in the revelation of Baha'u'llah into reality in the life of our society. This is the work of the divine plan, and we're the participants in that work. Our narrative is that human history is the process of our encounter with the divine source throughout the ages, which now achieves its consummation in the establishment of a world civilization founded upon unity justice and peace that has been foreseen by all of the great saints and prophets and messengers of past ages. And now we are here to build that civilization, that kingdom of God, as has been called in the scriptures of the past, particularly the, script, the Christian scripture. But that kingdom of God is not a miracle that descends upon us from the sky. Now, the revelation is a miracle, <laughs> the revelation of Baha'u'llah. But we are also agents of that miracle. We also have to work to build through sacrifice, through struggle, through increased understanding that civilization which has been foretold. And this is the time that we have to do it. And we have to build a pattern of life that actually achieves the desired result. So it's extremely important, friends, that we challenge ourselves to think very deeply what it is not only that Baha'u'llah has asked us to do, but even what the head of our faith today asks us to do. Because just as humanity has gone through a process of increasing closeness and understanding to its divine destiny, divinely ordained destiny, so too even within our own dispensation, the head of our faith helps us to understand where we are in prosecuting our mission and what has been achieved and what we must now do in order to get to the next level of development. The National Spiritual Assembly, just like the rest of us, grapples with these kinds of questions. And I'll tell you the story of something that took place over the course of 2016 and into early 2017, in early this year, about an interaction that the National Spiritual Assembly had with the Universal House of Justice to illustrate this point. We too, at about the midway point of the calendar year 2016, were, just like many of us, extremely dismayed at the, the fragmentation that we saw in our society, the increasing incidents, particularly of what seemed clear to be racially motivated acts of violence and hatred. And um, I don't want to say a resurgence of racism, perhaps so much as an unmasking of systemic racism and injustice that always has existed. Racism wasn't invented in this past election. This has been going on for a long time, but in some respects, now things became a little bit more nakedly apparent to those of us who were paying attention. And we began to ask ourselves, well, what does this mean for the American Baha'i community that we see these? And we began to 
feel confident as we read the writings and as we gauged what was happening in our country that we were entering a period of rapid acceleration in the forces of disintegration that were talked about by our beloved guardian and particularly when he talked about the United States, the future of this country. But that at the same time then, this would create opportunities for the forces of integration to gather force because the difficulties that people were experiencing might very well cause them to think new about what's going on around them and may create new receptivity to the teachings of Baha'u'llah. So with these thoughts in mind, we decided, well, you know, it's time to write a major letter to the American Baha'i community, which in a sense captures our idea of where we are and where we need to go, but that helps connect the dots between various things that we don't often hear the Baha'is thinking or talking about at the same time. What do I mean by that? Sometimes we ourselves too have what seemed to be a fragmented view of Baha'i activities, as if to say, well, we have the institute process over here with its sequence of courses and the things that we do and its core activities, but then we have race unity over there, another kind of activity, but not necessarily connected activities. Or we have the teaching of the cause and the building of participation, but then we have social action and we have engagement in the discourses of society. But how do these things re interrelate with each other? And are we really giving deep thought to what that needs to look like? So we crafted a draft letter. I'll make it very short because I see already I'm on, I'm on page two of six, but I'm more than halfway through my 30 minutes, so I'm going to have to edit. We drafted a statement to the American Baha'i community, but we decided before publishing that statement that we would want the House of Justice to comment on that statement. In other words, just we wanted to be sure that anything we had to say about their plan and the conditions in our society would be in sync with, at least in a general sense, with the thinking of the supreme body of the Baha'i faith. It's important to emphasize that this had nothing to do with the presidential election. You may think because of the timing that it was a reaction to who's in the White House, but it isn't. This, this process began long before we knew what the result was going to be. Now it happens that we had a result, but I don't want you to link those two things. So we sent this draft letter in November, and as it happened, two days after the presidential election, to the Universal House of Justice. And the House of Justice responded with great eagerness and excitement, saying, we think these ideas are wonderful and important, but we also feel that they deserve deeper exploration. And we invite you to send four of your members to come meet with us at your earliest possibility. So four members of the National Assembly were dispatched, and within 10 days we were sitting there in Haifa. They also invited three counselors who live here and two members of the ITC, of course, who are International Teaching Center, who are based there, and we sat with the members of the House of Justice. And the first thing I'll say about that, of course, friends, is you can imagine what a privilege it is to be in an environment like that, where for three days, the entire discussion was about the United States. What's going on in the United States? What are the conditions here? What are the conditions of the Baha'i community? And what are the, our challenges and opportunities? It was an amazing conversation. Sometimes you think the higher you go in an organization, the more conservative everybody gets. They're just interested in just, just do what we tell you. Now, it's true that the House of Justice, once it speaks as an institution, well, it has the same effect as the text itself, according to Abdu'l-Baha. So there's that element of divine guidance. But the process of consultation, friends, I have to assure you, the, the members of the House of Justice are so loving and encouraging and sincerely, humbly interested in everything you have to say. They really want to learn and, and consider ideas. Now, later the House speaks, and that's a different issue. But in the consultation, it's just a collegial, warm, joyous exercise, even in a serious matter such as this, to participate in. So we had this, and then essentially after that, they made no comment on our letter, by the way. They just said, all right, we've had our three days of consultation. Now, you take whatever you want from it, and if you want to change your letter, fine. If you don't, you can send it the way it is. But they left it to the National Assembly, so they didn't really edit the letter. But the letter that came out was the February 25th letter that you've seen and is in your program. And I'll spend the next few minutes just highlighting a few points that came out in the consultation 
with members of the Universal House of Justice because I think they're, they're worth thinking about. First, very much was this affirmation of this feeling that the members of the National Assembly had that the United States is entering a critical stage in its national life. And it's apparent from virtually any perspective, indicating an acceleration of the negative forces associated with the declining order. But at the same time, the Baha'is have developed new levels of capacity. And together, these conditions suggest great possibilities for applying the healing remedy of Baha'u'llah in our land. The second point was that the framework for action is very wide and accommodates an array of initiatives that can be and should be harmonized. It can't be reduced to a very limited set of activities without making it artificial and in the end unworkable. And third, we have to move forward boldly, but thoughtfully and in a process of learning. Other points that came to mind. Often when we think of what we're doing in a community, we think in terms of, well, we talk about activities or books or courses or firesides or what have you. But what we're really engaged in fundamentally is in building a new civilization. We have to have the capacity, friends, to see the end in the beginnings that we're making. A new civilization. What are the characteristics of that new civilization? And how are these activities building the capacities and characteristics that help us advance towards that vision? Well, if we look, for example, at the sequence of courses, we can see that these address fundamental issues and needs that are apparent in our society and that need to be fostered if we're going to build a truly inclusive and participatory community life. The idea of moral education for children and for junior youth is an obvious one. And friends, there's no such thing as values-free education. Nobody in this country is just learning math and science. There are values being instilled in the people of this country, even in the way those subjects are taught that are very important for us not to be naive about. And we have to instill also values in young people that are more in accord with spiritual reality and their true natures and their true potentials. This notion in study circles of walking together in a path of service, of accompaniment, of loving encouragement of each other, of having elevated conversations with each other centered on the word of God, this idea of collaboration rather than competition, and the spiritual qualities that come from interaction with the Word of God, then that are expressed in increasingly complex acts of service to the world, bring out our capacities for love, for sacrifice, for assuming the, the, the hopes and the aspirations of others as our own hopes and aspirations. So they, we, we work with them and welcome them, with them to participate, to participate and to contribute to the betterment of the world. Now, of course, all of these things are essential, and they all naturally, if we do it right, lead to urgent and important other conversations and actions that also need to be taking place. Sometimes I've heard people say, for example, where racial understanding is concerned, well, you know, race unity really in America isn't really addressed in the books of the sequence, so we shouldn't be talking about that. that that's not necessary. Other Baha'is feel, I think, like for the sake of unity or for the sake of togetherness, we shouldn't talk about difficult issues, and let's just talk about love and, and the, you know, read the hidden words or something like that. But friends, if we love each other, truly, if this is the result of what we do, then naturally conversations are going to arise where we're able to share with each other whatever we have in our lives, whatever that pain may be, whatever the burdens we may carry, because we have friends who are ready to listen to us about that. And if I, for example, may be unconscious of that, I can learn about that from others who are suffering from that. And I speak very consciously as a white southerner who has had a lot to learn and still has a lot to learn about this issue. But I'm dedicated to learning about that issue. And that's the idea that in, a, in an atmosphere of love, we should have these conversations, but more than conversations. We can even take action together in the community, in the larger society, to engage in discourse, to undertake social action initiatives, to do many other things that arise from our genuine concern 
for the welfare of others. So this basic sequence of courses and these basic activities are the core activities. They're the fundamental activities of any attempt in a community to create the maximum conditions for people to come in and to participate, but then for all of these other things to be generated. The core activities, not the sole activities of the community. So it's important to keep that vision in mind. And in clusters around the world, we have to be careful that we're aware of this. Another point that came out in the conversation with the House of Justice is the idea that we have to have our means consistent with our ends. Many people in our society wish to see justice established and unity to be established, yet resort to a pattern of behavior that itself aggravates the divisions that already exist, dividing people into good guys and bad guys, and if you're wrong, you're also bad, and, and not really succeeding in bringing people together in the earnest and honest search for solutions. This was one of the issues that the House members raised with us is use of language. And they said, take a look at how we address the Baha'is of Iran when, in our messages. Now, they know perfectly well that non-Baha'is in Iran read those same messages. And when they refer to Iranians as a whole, they always say, now, they are very real about the persecutions that are going on, and they're very candid about that in all of these messages. Yet, when describing Iranians as a whole, they describe them as fair-minded, as reasonable, as wanting to see justice. You see what I mean? In other words, their assumption is to appeal to the nobler aspirations of individuals rather than condemning them. So we appeal to what is best in the heart of every other individual, yet without sacrificing the honesty and the candor and the reality of what else also is happening. And this, I think, is an important phrase in our letter, the NSA's letter to the community. How do we while not avoiding the harsh realities that exist in our society, also appeal to the nobler aspirations of our fellow citizens. It's something, friends, I think we have to learn together how to do. Now, I am running out of time very fast. I guess I'll end with these few things. First, the plan works. Friends, there is only one internationally elected body representing the people of the planet in existence today. It's the Universal House of Justice. Only one. There is only one community in the world that has members from virtually every conceivable ethnic, racial, tribal, religious background that one can conceive, who are together in a learning process with unity of vision, unity of purpose, and wherever you go, friends, as you know, you can, you can show up in a Pacific island in a Baha'i community and feel just as home as you do here. Only one, only one community can say this, and that's the Baha'i faith. The little children's class in a village in Africa a few years ago now is a Baha'i school for children, teaching all the sciences and literature and reading as well as moral development. There are countries where every junior youth is now taking our junior youth spiritual empowerment program. There are clusters with thousands upon thousands of participants all walking a path of service together and many of them eventually becoming avowed believers in the blessed beauty. In the Democratic Republic of the Congo, in their bicentenary observances, where, by the way, about every, about every six months, they add to their participants in core activities 30,000 people, which is all the participants we have in the United States. So every six months, they're, they're doing what we've done again. And on those two days of the Twin Holy Days, do you know, 17,000 people became Baha'is in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, 17,000. We don't want to confuse the idea that we want participants in community life, but we don't want more Baha'is. We want both. But what we're doing is we're creating an atmosphere where everyone is on their spiritual journey with us. Together, we're walking that path. Some people become Baha'is, avowedly Baha'is. Some people don't. Everyone is welcome, though. And that's the revolution that the Baha'i faith offers. What other religion can say this? 
that, it, that you can join and help us build a better world, whether or not you're a member. Well, it's an important thing to be able to say. How Abdul Baha like is that now, to be creating a culture like that? But of course it's one where we lovingly invite people to become Baha'is, and we don't lose sight of that need, but it's in this larger context. So we have this institution, we have this worldwide community, we have this learning process, we have this unity of vision, we have these clusters around, and the one being in history who has achieved it is Baha'u'llah. The one being in history who has achieved it is Baha'u'llah. The last point, and I apologize if I go two minutes over time to my friends. You can write me a letter of complaint later if you, if you wish. But I regret the delayed response. I love that, um, that response. So, um, is the question of sacrifice. The, the House members were very keen to talk with us about that, and we spent the, most of the last day on this issue of sacrifice and consecration. We saw some wonderful presentations yesterday that had to do with uh, friends who had undertaken initiatives to help those in distress in various parts of the world, and they're wonderful, and these are to be encouraged, absolutely. But we don't have to go far to find injustice. Injustice can be found five minutes from here in every corner of our land, in every community, in every city, people who need to be a part of what we're doing. Not help in the sense that we go and help them and uplift them. They need to join us in the process of uplifting our country. And there's a big difference in those two statements. It's not for us to say, come and do what we do and be like us. It's come show us, help us learn how to be something new, a new race of men that the world has never yet seen, a very different distinction. And this, I think, speaks to our destiny as the spiritual descendants of the dawnbreakers that the guardian himself gave us, that appellation, is the extent to which we're able to achieve that attitude, to bear the sufferings of others, to work with them, to live amongst them. It calls to mind to me a, a wonderful occasion in 1953 in Chicago when Dorothy Baker, representing the guardian of the Baha'i faith, came to this country for a continental conference launching the 10-year crusade. And she fresh from the Holy Land, noted that our beloved guardian continually mentioned the dark-skinned races of the world, and that for the United States of America, he said one driving thing over and over, that if we did not, and I'm quoting from her, that if we did not meet the challenging requirement of raising to a vast number the believers of the Negro race, disaster would result. And second, that it was now for us to arise and reach the Indians of this country. In fact, he went so far as to say that this dual task is the most important teaching work on American shores today. Now recently the House has also added the immigrant populations to these historic populations. But the, she, she then recounted the praise of Shoghi Effendi for Ali Nahjavani and Philip Hainsworth, two young believers who had settled in Central Africa and had achieved marvelous victories in teaching really through their sincere and unbounded love for its peoples. As she put it, where the people lived, they lived. What they ate, Ali and Philip ate. Where they went, they went. They suffered with them, they were ill with them, everything was with them, and they had this attitude of uh, such freedom that the guardian himself described Mr. Nakhchevani as a soul entirely free from prejudice. But the impact was thousands of people came into the faith in Central Africa, not least of them Enoch Olinga, who was destined to become a hand of the cause of God. And so concluding her remarks, she said, is there an Ali Nakhchevani then in America? Is there a Philip Hainsworth? And we ask it again today. They will be the young people now who will rise to the challenge, settling and working among these receptive populations who are destined, as we know from the writings, to make significant contributions to world civilization and whose potentials only have to be unleashed by their interaction with Baha'u'llah, with the Word of God. So in our, our workshop later today, my dear friend Todd Ewing and I are going to explore some of these themes 
And uh, if you would like to come to it, please try to attend both se sessions. And we recommend that you read the February 25th letter one more time. It's in your agenda, and it sort of refreshes you on some of the concepts that, that we'll be talking about. To conclude, friends, and I thank you for your, your patience with me, we are living in significant, unparalleled times, and we may have opportunities that we won't see again for quite a long time. So will we take advantage of them? Will we exploit them? And will we use them to advance the cause of Baha'u'llah and give hope to the people of our land? Thank you so much.